<clears throat> Welcome everybody to Mindful Social. Uh, this week we have Beth Cantor and Elisa Sherman to come and talk about <clears throat> Happy Healthy Nonprofit. Here's the book. We oh wow! <laughs> um, I'm getting a little bit of an echo. Would you guys just check and see if you have another window with the show or the blog post open? Because it's usually that that makes it echoey, 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 echoey. I'm pretty sure I don't. <laughs> I don't. I have one window <clears throat> open, which is like a miracle. <laughs> it's a miracle. Okay, I'm not hearing an echo anymore, so we're just going to go with that. Uh, so welcome, you guys. I, I really enjoyed the book. Um, as you know, I have some interest in this subject myself, and I really think that it's come out at an amazing time. But I would like to say that I'd like you to do a sequel for for-profit businesses because we suffer too. <laughs> yeah. So why don't, you, why don't you guys uh, introduce yourselves and, and tell us a little bit about yourselves? And let's start with you, Beth. Great. So, um, so I've worked in the nonprofit sector about 35 years, uh, my whole career, uh, whole focus. And I was lucky enough, actually, that I was early adopter of tech um, and uh, started back a little bit later than Elisa, uh, back in 1992, uh, when nonprofits were just starting to get on the internet and trying to figure out how can we use this stuff for our mission-driven work. And my... Um, uh, you know, place in that kind of um, history has been uh, to be as a trainer. So I was kind of learning from the techies and then translating to nonprofits and doing a lot of, um, you know, a training in person, online and support. And I've uh, served as a visiting scholar at the David Michelle Packard Foundation, where I wrote uh, the first two books, uh, The Network Nonprofit with Allison Fine and Measuring the Network Nonprofit with Katie Payne. And uh, from that, I've just done a, a lot of speaking and uh, training uh, to help build capacity and leadership uh, of nonprofits. And, um, and it was a couple of years ago, I think, that uh, Elise and I sort of ran into each other at what Wisdom 2.0. Yeah. Yeah. And we started talking about like <laughs> tech burnout and whatever. Um, so I'd hand it over to Elisa. So, yes, yeah. I've known Beth, gosh. It must have been since the mid 90s. My internet experience dates back to going online in 1987 and starting to consult companies about the internet in 1992, and then starting the first woman owned internet company in 1995 called Cyber Girl, and then an organization to help women learn about the internet called Web Girls International. And I began writing books. So Happy Healthy Nonprofit is my 11th book. Wow. And it's been an absolute thrill to write the book with Beth and to uh, start to plan our book tour, which is coming up. So my career went from nonprofit organization, running a nonprofit. Prior to that, I was working for Metallica and Def Leppard in the music business. <laughs> so it's like this leap from heavy metal to running a nonprofit organization in New York City to internet business. <laughs> and I still consult uh, nonprofit organizations and for-profit companies about digital marketing. So that's my day job when not writing books. So okay. I'm excited to be here. And I think Beth's going to tell you a little bit more about the book. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it looked Let's start actually with how you two got together to do the book together because you're kind of an unlikely pair in some you think way. So? <laughs> well, you know, a we're, little. Like, we're both super mm -hmm. geeky. Yeah. <laughs> That's <not> so. <laughs> well, well I can imagine what the editing process was, but we don't need to go there. <laughs> Well, you know, Janet, I saw you ra raise your hand when uh, Lisa mentioned Cyber Girls. Mm. So, you remember Cyber Girls? Right. Yeah, it was me too. Because, you yeah. know, back in those days, you know, I was trying to figure out HTML and RGB codes. <laughs> remember those? And, um, and there wasn't any place or, to get help or connect with other women, especially. And that, that's where I first met Aliza. Yeah, mid-90s. And then back at Wisdom 2.0, we ran into each other and we started, you know, sort of talking about, you know, is it really a good thing to be online so much and to be so, I'm going to say the word addicted to our tech. Um, yes. <laughs> right. We have to hold it or, or else we get anxious. Yeah. And, um, and then a couple of years later, we we're sort of on these parallel paths, um, uh, 
not always next to each other. Uh, you know, we went through the death of our fathers. Um, and then we both experienced uh, burnout at various times from overworking and um, not taking care of ourselves. And, and also like the ill effects of um, tech, you know, and not being mindful around it, um, being more addicted. And so, um, so at that time I was really obsessed with walking and walking meetings, if you remember Janet, and sort of yes. talking about that. And then um, and Lisa said, well, why don't we write a book on tech wellness? And we sort of pitched that and my editor at uh, Wiley said, you know, make it, think about a bigger topic. So it got into this whole idea about self care. Um, so that's the first part of the book, how nonprofit uh, professionals can take care of themselves and then how they bring that into the workplace. How do they create a culture of well-being? So it's really an appropriate topic for nonprofits and especially at this time of year when nonprofits are ramping up to what's probably the most frenzied time of year for them. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really crazy fundraising time and everybody's running like mad. So, you know, why don't we dive right into some ways that people can really help themselves deal with that, both in tech or whether they're not in tech and they're just driving themselves crazy on a hamster wheel. <laughs> Can I uh, maybe give a little framework first and then yeah. and then Beth can dive into some really concrete tips. So in the book, as Beth said, the first part is for the individual. The second part is for the organization or how the individual can bring self-care into the organization. And we call that we care. Well, we also have a bigger framework called the five spheres of happy, healthy living. So it's how we relate to different aspects of our life and world. Mm -hmm. And self-care can be applied to all of them if you're mindful about it. So it's relationship to self, relationship to others, relationship to the environment, relationship to work and money, and then finally relationship to tech, which is kind of a new realm in the last just few decades in terms of how we are so interrelated with technology now. So, but all of those areas can, we can apply self-care and then we drill it down to what we call the wellness triad, the foundation, the basics of self-care, sleep, nutrition, and fitness. And I'll mm -hmm. turn it over to Beth to start with some really concrete, uh, even I would say simple tips. Uh, they're really time. harder to change, but they're, they're small little tips to get started with. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, before I go there, <laughs> I was thinking about because you're, you know, uh, the parallels between, you know, small business, startups, and small to mid sized nonprofits all have this, um, th this mindset of overwork, you know, that we're going to just power through it. We're just going to, uh, you know, I'll sleep when I'm dead. Um, I'm just going to work, 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 as, as my kids like to say. And so I guess the question that we all have to ask ourselves is, working these long hours at the expense of our home life and even our health, does that really help our business or our nonprofit achieve results? And so a, a lot of the research that we looked at in the book, and there's tons and tons of studies on it, the answer to that is a flat no. Um, and there's one study in particular done at Stanford, just right up the road here, that um, after 50 hours of work during the week, your productivity decreases, okay? Um, the researcher is a guy named John Per. Perkovell from Stanford University, and there's basically a drastic dip after 55 hours or more of work. So that if you, the output of anything um, after 70 hours of work is greatly, uh, is barely greater than the output of after 50 hours. So basically mm -hmm. there's, um, uh, you know, about 14 hours of wasted time, right? And so that's the time actually you should be using to take care of yourself. Um, because it'll help you be more productive. So what's the first thing? The first thing that both of us always tell people to do is get a good night's sleep, okay? Protect your asset. So um, a lot of us, you know, I'm myself included, well, you know, I'm going to just chase down a few more emails, you know, before I go to bed. <laughs> and, you know, and I would cheat myself out of a good night's sleep. And I, I really couldn't uh, perform well. Um, so if you skimp on your sleep, it's like showing up to work being drunk mm -hmm. or, co or otherwise cognitively impaired. And is that what you want to bring to your work? Do your customers, do your, the people you serve, do they deserve that? So, um, so research says, and this is according to the National Sleep Foundation, that adults need between seven and nine hours a night of sleep to function. Some people need less, some people may need more. 
And so I, being a Fitbit user, it also tracks your sleep and also being a little bit of a data nerd, I, I actually started keeping a sleep diary of how many hours I slept and then how I felt and how I, you know, did I, was in a good mood, was I more productive? And my magic number was seven hours and 45 minutes of sleep. So in order to commit to that, okay, so I have some data here, but now it comes down to like making a ch change in my life. I mean, we don't know how easy that is, right? Don't eat that chocolate candy. That's by the door. That's left over. You know how hard that is. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but, I do. Um, oh, but so, so then I had to like make a commitment to change my nighttime routine. You know, kick the iPhone out of the bedroom. Um, don't do email right until <laughs> right before or your head drops on the pillow because that disrupts your sleep. Um, Let's talk about that a little bit specifically, though. I know that you did some things like getting an alarm clock and putting it next to your bed rather than having your iPhone. And there've been a lot of studies about looking at white screens before you go to bed that you're not really gonna hit that REM as early as you thought you were going to. So even though you're getting that sleep, it's not really deep sleep. Yeah, I mean, what um, the blue light or those white screens suppresses melatonin production, which is required to get you into a, a, a normal sleep cycle, which includes what you called REM or rapid eye movement, which is your, your dreaming phase and what you but need. It messes up the circadian rhythms. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what you need for um, to repair your body, to give your brain a rest, um, to let your subconscious think about other things and be creative. Um, yeah. So, I mean, Aliza can talk about that. I mean, she yeah, has some so really good tips. Yeah. It, it falls into the tech wellness, which is one of my favorite topics. And mm -hmm besides the idea of getting a real alarm clock and Beth, is it called the moonbeam alarm clock? Yeah. <laughs> the moonbeam clock, which gently wakes you up with light. I thought it was created by our governor, but no. Oh, really? <laughs> no. <laughs> so no. the other tips in general to keep electronics out of the bedroom, and that also mm -hmm. means tablets. I mean, I get into a bad habit of watching shows on my iPad, that also means television. So it's just mm -hmm. electronics out of the bedroom. And another thing that uh, we do at our house is a charging station. So you set up the charging appliances at the front door or someplace in the house that's out of the way of the areas where you hang out with your family. And it forces you to think twice as you start to walk to get your phone. It's not there within reach compulsive. Mm -hmm. And my kids, all of us, we take a little more time to be a little more thoughtful about it. Plus, you can see when they're sneaking over to use it. <laughs> uh, but they can also see when you're sneaking over to use it. Mm -hmm. So those two very simple changes, making this no tech zone or no tech time, literally putting it into your schedule for your device to remind you to turn it off for a little while, to walk away from it, or to step away from it your desk and your computer screens. Mm -hmm. So taking those kinds of breaks, even five or 10 or 15 minutes at a time and walking away. And, and Beth mentioned walking already, but that's sort of the next piece of this puzzle is more movement. Yeah. Right. And I was saying like at nighttime, instead of bringing your iPhone, bring your iPhone zero, your pad and your magic <laughs> markers, <laughs> do, you know, do something tactical. Um, oh, meditative so, art. Oh, yeah, wait, I, art. Just, so wait, I just had my pad here, the, the latest one that I was working on, and it has my daughter's name hidden in it. Oh, <laughs> So oh, this, is, this is what uh, I, I really learned a lot uh, from Beth throughout this entire process. And one of the things was her incredible love of pens of all kinds <laughs> and magic markers and mine too. We were super obsessed with them and how we could turn it into, <laughs> look at this, look at her. We could turn this into a meditative process. And it yeah. sounds very trivial and it sounds, I don't think people understand how potent it is to, to go analog, to literally get back to paper and pen. It, it works a different part of your brain. It shifts your thinking and, and it brings you down a lot of notches. So I think people shouldn't just shirk that and think, oh, that's trivial or that's uh, playtime. Uh, playtime is actually good time. Oh, I've right. seen studies about doodles too. I know, Beth, you actually got me hooked on Zen tangles too. So I do it too. <laughs> it's a very meditative practice because you're really not focusing on anything else, the distractions disappear. And there have been a lot of studies about people who doodle during meetings 
that it actually helps them process because they're actually putting something on paper while they're listening to what's going on. So watching somebody doodle in a meeting isn't necessarily meaning that they're boring. It may be how they process. And just the hand, um, using a pen, putting this in your hand and doing this, mm -hmm. it lights up a different part of your brain. Mm -hmm. and, and there's some studies show that it it's actually can help you remember things better. I mean, one of the things, I, before I got into Zentangles, I did like things like this. this I'm not gonna show, that's my to-do list. It was like this <laughs> meditative thing, sit down every morning <laughs> and color, you know, draw a drawing around my to-do list and it just, you know, instead of just jumping into the screen, where sometimes if I do that first, I feel a sense of vertigo, an actual sense of vertigo. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's a it's weird, but when you actually go analog, it really centers you. And here we are, two techies telling people to go analog, but you know, <laughs> it's it's really you have to have a little bit of both. We totally love technology. We appreciate the value. In fact, we have a, a whole section of, of the book throughout that talks about the apps you can use to help you with self-care. Mm -hmm. So apps, uh, Beth came up with this, apps as agents of self-care. So there's, <laughs> there's mindfulness apps. There's coloring apps like Color5. There are yoga apps. Take a yoga break. There are even apps that you can put onto your browser called Fitbolt, for example, and Fitbolt, mm. um, F-I-T-B-O-L-T, it will ping you and remind you to get up away from your desk, and it shows you in photos actual exercises you can do. Mm. And then you can rate them, and then they'll show you more of the ones you like. Desk Yogi is another one that literally just pops up on your screen and shows you a video of a yoga move, a stretch at the desk that you can do. So technology can be useful. It's just in the proper doses and in the proper context and being intentional intentional about it as opposed to being addicted i mean and, and the, the process uh, that all those apps were doing is you're using it to remind yourself to do something to remind yourself to be focused to remind mm -hmm. yourself to be paying attention and to be present as opposed to just getting lost in the screen um you know, I remember the old days back in the 90s when I would roll out of bed. This is embarrassing. And I don't do this too much anymore. Roll out of bed, run to the computer <laughs> and like sit there and work, not even eat until and I look up and it would be like two o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, and then it'd be time to eat and then run back to the computer <laughs> and keep on going, you know, because it sucks you in. It's like an addiction yeah. almost. And if you're mm -hmm. And if you've trained yourself and if you've transformed your brain to think about that, you're not even aware of what it's doing to you, you know, mm -hmm. or how fizzled you may feel. So it's moving from mindless to mindful. You and I think choice. If anybody in the nonprofit sector knows that we can get sucked in. We get sucked in because we're passionate about the mission, but then we get sucked in because everyone around us is sacrificing and we think it's a noble thing and everyone's overworked and tired. And, and so we get sucked into that. And then with the technology, it adds another layer of getting sucked in and drained and depleted. And so all these things that we say in the book are about replenishing, resting, uh, even relaxing, which we talk about <laughs> real vacations, like take a real vacation and prepare your whole organization for the fact that you're away and everyone respect that. You mm -hmm. respect yourself and, and allow yourself that time and that break. But everyone around you, your colleagues need to respect that as well and take care of yourself and take care of each other. Like you can't take care of anyone else until you take care of yourself. So these are all the kinds of things we talk about in the book. And that is a big part of self-care too, is that you can't take care of everyone else unless you're taking care of yourself. Absolutely, in fact, what uh, we suggest in the book um, is to, as one of those first steps, is to create a self-care bill of rights. And this comes from um, our colleague, um, Aisha Moore, who you might know works in um, health justice and social justice um, groups as our day, day job, but she also uh, writes a blog, Self Care by Aisha. And so she went through a horrible burnout um, where she was going out, um, waiting for the elevator and she fainted. And so they had to call an ambulance and whisk her to the ER. And when she got back her diagnosis, her doctor said, uh, well, this is just work stress. And she's like, work stress? I love my job. <laughs> and it was just a real like, 
you know, moment for her to say, I got to stop. I got to stop these crazy days and, and ignoring myself. So she started this uh, amazing routine of, of self-care, uh, which started with this Bill of Rights. It's like, I deserve it. And these are the things I'm going to do to take care of myself, to take care of others. Now, um, so, and even if you go up to her blog, she has this thing where you can actually click a button and you can type in what your self-care Bill of Rights is, and then it'll produce a document for you that oh, you right. can then uh, print and put on your um, on your desk. So what is it? Is it going to be, you know, to commit to getting enough sleep, um, to eating more vegetables, to walking more, to meditating, to do Zen tangles, to have a, you know, take some downtime, to take brain breaks, to disconnect now and then, you know, what are the things that you're going to do to take care of yourself and you deserve it? So, Something that I think people may be tempted to do after they read the book is do all of it at once. <laughs> How productive is that going to be for people? Is, is it going to be something where we're just going to burn ourselves out on, on <laughs> self care? Right? You burn yourself out on mindfulness and self care. Yeah, right? you know, I think one of the things that we included in the book, and Beth introduced me to it, is um, BJ Fogg's Tiny Habits. And the whole concept of to make big change, you have to start small. To truly have change happen, you mm. can't overwhelm yourself. And so we do give examples of different ways that you can put together your self-care plan, either individually or organizationally. But on the individual side especially, we say, you know what? It's okay if you start with one thing, mm. one thing today. And In fact, we recommend week or a month. Yeah. We, we recommend it. And the, yeah. and the one thing should not be too big you know i'm going to start meditating every day for an hour or whatever you know <laughs> what about um starting with okay i'm going to take i'm going to, for one minute when i feel overwhelmed i'm going to um do a one minute headspace meditation or i'm just going to breathe um, oh i like your thing though that you had said of uh, you would as the coffee is being made just right. sit and breathe and what elisa's mm -hmm. bringing up is that you have, that's the first part of tiny habits is to, to um, identify one small incremental change that you can do. And the next thing is to have a trigger. You know, when are you going to do it? When is the right time? And so when I wanted to start meditating, I chose the coffee uh, machine because I do that every day and I have to wait a minute for this coffee to brew. Damn it. I want it now. Where's my coffee? So why not pull the chair up, push that button and try to breathe, you know? Right. And so if you get, you know, a small habit, you have the right trigger, and then you have some accountability, whether that's tracking it or with another person, um, then you have that kind of loop to change your habit and make it part of what you do. Gail mentions in the chat that a meditation ritual is good, and I think any kind of self-care ritual is good. That once you start to to small rituals, then you can expand them, and it becomes something that you can then repeat. But if you say, you know, every morning when I wake up, I'm going to meditate for an hour. In the first place, an hour is a hell of a long time to start meditating. And in the second place, something's going to come up. Your phone's going to ring. You're going to have to go to the bathroom. You're going to have to go make your coffee. Figuring out when those times are and using the coffee maker is, is brilliant because, gosh, <clears throat> that can be frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> I don't drink coffee and it's frustrating. Well, the tea, the teapot, the <laughs> hot water, the hot water heating on the stove as opposed to the microwave that gives you plenty of time. The, the ritual is so right, um, Gail's point about rituals, because then that becomes routine. It becomes a habit. And I just know with the walking, when I started, I'd walk around the block. That was my first, that was like 800 steps. And if I said, I'm just going to do that 10 minutes, walk around the block. And then mm -hmm. I gradually upped it. Um, and now when I don't do it, I just feel like this morning, I just didn't get a chance to do it because, you know, I had some early calls I had to do, which I don't normally schedule, but, um, I did do it. Then I had this, so I haven't done my 5,000 steps before getting into the office. And I feel like, Oh, I just feel out of routine. Mm, and it's also, know? it's really motivating for me to, to watch Beth because, well, she does 15,000 to 20,000 steps a day. Not I'm, every I'm day. Like, okay. <laughs> well, a lot of days because I'm lucky to get 1,200 most days. And mm. I, try, I try not to use the excuse that I'm in Alaska. It's icy outside. It's dangerous. 
but the thing that she would do when we're to, we were together writing the book and we'd <laughs> be at a hotel and, and all of a sudden she goes, let's walk the hall. And she would literally <laughs> walk us up and down the hall over and over again. And after a while, I'd be like, is this going to end? <laughs> and we kept going. She checked the steps and the numbers and we kept going. And I thought to myself, I have never been that committed, but it was such a great idea. So now when I'm in hotels, I walk the hall over mm -hmm. and over again. And I just keep on seeing how many, how many steps. So that motivation and that accountability. But the trigger for that was when we were, you know, we had been sitting um, and we were like working things out and we were in this like really great groove. And then all of a sudden we got to this point, like, yeah. And the idea is, uh, um, uh, uh, and yeah. we were like struggling brain for fog. words and we were brain fog and we're like, yeah. oh, is there anything to eat? <laughs> Let's go take a nap. Then that was like, to me, that's my body's cue to say, you need a break. Your body works mm -hmm. in these natural rhythms. And so often we just fight it and we power through. But if you took 10 minutes and took a walk, it's like rebooting your brain. Yep. It worked. Literally. Yep. It worked. And that works really well for creatives too. You know, if, if they're running into a creative block, whether you're writing or you're drawing or you're building a website, get up and leave and go for one minute, just one minute, walk down to the corner and back, whatever it takes to just break that. And I think, uh, Beth, some time ago, you, you shared some research about how walking changes <laughs> your brain and, and how that really does kind of make a shift. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, I think the research, if I remember, there's two that I always refer to. Um, <clears throat> my favorite's from the University of Illinois, and it's actually to make the case for physical education in schools, but they show two brain scans. <clears throat> One that's completely dark, and that's after sitting for 20 minutes, and the other where, the, where it's lit up, where the synapses are firing, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and that's after a 20 minute walk. So I was asked, what kind of brain do you want to bring to work? <laughs> you know, or what kind of brain do you want your employees to bring to work? Yeah. A oh, sleepy brain or a creative brain. And, and in the book too, we talk about walking meetings, which Beth mentioned earlier. And that was mm -hmm. an entirely new concept to me that there is literally the movement to walk as work and not to look at walking or going for a walk during the work day as leaving your work necessarily that you could actually be productive and meet with people and you all are walking and mm -hmm. then the, the issue of how do you take notes uh, while well, you've got the phone with the voice memo on it right, or... which janet's really great at <laughs> oh okay <laughs> i mean I walk, done walking meetings with janet she taught me that <laughs> well I, I am a newbie when it comes to walking meetings but even a simple thing as whenever you're on a call Use your mobile phone and walk around as you're talking. Mm -hmm. uh, I just did that recently on a teleconference where I was actually presenting and I was able to move around. And I think it really made me feel more dynamic as I was speaking. Yeah. And keep me more alert. Or even just that's standing. A weird, that's <laughs> a weird standing. thing. When I do webinars, I have a standing desk. And so I find it much better to stand when I'm do giving a webinar and I don't know why exactly, but it does help me feel more dynamic and, and more present. Yeah. Um, I, and I, do, I can't do it with video. <laughs> <laughs> I can I'll start walking around and then. You know. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about how organizations can be helping their employees learn to be a little bit more uh, mindful about how they take care of themselves and, and, you know, I, I am assuming that this is really a top-down thing. If you can't get the buy-in at the top, it ain't going to happen. It's both. Top-down, yeah. bottom-up. Bottom up. Employee engagement is really key, as well as leadership modeling. Because the, the leader's behavior is really contagious. So, even, you know, even if they're in a bad mood, that can spread through the organization like a cold. Um, so if the leader is you know, a workaholic and modeling, not staying at the office till eight o'clock at night, then that's sort of the unwritten rule that everyone else needs to do that as well. So the leader needs to model self-care, not ignore it, not give it lip, lip service and not punish people uh, for suggesting it. And mm. at the same time, employees also need, you know, self-care is very customized and personal to the people. And so you can't impose, you can't just say, hey, um, everyone's gonna do yoga. <laughs> Uh, unless, no. 
unless, you know, and I see uh, Megan uh, Penguin here, uh, who's great at doing workplace yoga stuff, but, yeah. and she'll tell us, you know, it has to be something that everyone wants to do or, or else you'll do it once and then it'll get lost on the schedule. So that both leadership as well as uh, employee engagement. And there's two organizations in particular that always pop up in my head when people ask, you know, tell us some stories from the book. One of them is Nancy Lublin and the other one is Justin Chase. Um, I'll talk about Nancy. Do you want to talk about Justin after Beth? Um, sure. I had okay. another one I had thought about, but. <laughs> oh, a different one. Oh, well, the, uh, so I'll just do the Nancy Lublin one really quickly because Beth and I have both known her for years. Nancy Lublin founded Dress for Success, then Do Something, and now she's with Crisis Text Line, a suicide prevention line, high stress nonprofit, I mean, absolutely high stress. And she went in an interview, she said, well, self-care is bull beep. <laughs> she <laughs> totally startled me when she said that, but her belief is you either love your job or you're out of love, and if you're out of love with your job, change it. So one of the mm. things that she actually does is she offers employees, uh, I believe it's a month of pay to go look for another job if you're not happy. She does mm. that, doesn't want that culture suck uh, in her organization. Another thing she does is she, in her employee handbook, makes a statement about self-care. I mean, talk about organizational commitment to self-care. And then another thing is she doesn't wait till someone burns out before she offers a sabbatical. Built into their processes after two years, you get a sabbatical and you're mm. pressured to take that sabbatical. And they suggest that you do something outdoors for a completely different change of pace and even in a different country, someplace that you've always wanted to go and to volunteer. And so this is a great way of demonstrating a leader who is so committed that it's it's an integral part of the way she runs that organization. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, uh, not it's uh, half of the equation. I think is her leadership, and the other is making sure and protecting the culture, mm -hmm. and it, at bringing people in who share those values around self care. Um, so uh, another one I, I was thinking of when I saw uh, uh, Megan, it made me think of um, Julia Smith from um, Interfaith. Um, I want to say council in Chicago, which is a, a student group. Um, and they have, um, the, on the employee engagement side, they have an, a, a committee uh, that they call the Giddy Committee <laughs> that, um, that actually is in charge of like getting feedback from staff and coming up with um, common group activities and making you know, the workplace more friendly, uh, more communal, um, uh, and, and being more caring to one another, um, especially around their uh, work, you know, their, their handbook and their work policies. So one thing um, they do things like, you know, they put a ping pong table in the break room because people were saying, let's have some fun. Let's bring some play. You know, when we want to take a break, um, you know, because that, that would be fun. And that's what we want to do. So they got a ping pong table. Another thing they heard from employees is that they wanted some quiet time. Um, or they called it meditation time and, mm -hmm. you know, to go to a museum or to take off. And, um, and so they got a uh, membership or they encouraged people uh, as part of their work. They, they would pay for two hours a month for them to go to the museum or have some quiet time just, you know, offsite to think about work or to think about a creative project. And what they found is that nobody was doing it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so when they, they found out why is that, well, none of the senior staff have used this. So, um, so what they did is they got uh, their, their senior vice president and also the CEO to send an email out to everybody saying, hey, for my meditation time, I'm going off to the museum this week to see this exhibit. It's related to some of the work we do. What are you doing? So, mm -hmm. um, so the importance of having um, employee engagement to determine the activities as well as you know, leadership to endorse it and model it. Yeah, I can imagine that that's, that's hugely important important having not worked in an organization for a very long <laughs> <Me time. either. laughs> it's, it's something that i have to see from the outside but you know it's it's um i think you know there's so much pressure and then you look at companies like eileen fisher uh where she really started her mindfulness program within the company by saying every morning we're going to do yoga and the whole company did yoga uh you know at first it was grudgingly 
later, it kind of got to be a habit. And then it expands from there. So I, I don't think that, you know, there has to be a really strong policy that we're all going to do a whole bunch of things to make the organization strong. It's more starting small, getting people to adopt, and then adding things in incrementally. Is, is that correct? Yeah, and especially getting feedback, you know, mm -hmm. um, yeah. from your employees and getting them engaged and uh, empowering them. And, you know, for example, I mean, we always say that the quick fixes don't work, you know. And <laughs> there's this great story about uh, uh, one of the organizations that, that downloaded the signs from the CDC that say, you know, take the stairs, don't take the elevator, um, you know, to get more exercise into your day. But nobody was doing it. And mm -hmm. then a little bit later on, they, they did some research and they looked at the stairwell and there were rats and cockroaches <laughs> and it was dirty <laughs> and it wasn't well lit. So, of course, no one's going to take the stairs. Right. You know? So, the quit, you, you know, you have to do your research. You have to get feedback from employees and has to be and then leadership has to model it and has to become part of the, the culture and the way that the organization does its work. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I think I'm um, setting up the committee, like the Giddy Committee or or some other kind of employee engagement committee and empowering them is so important. And I had mentioned earlier, Justin Chase, and I'm blanking on his organization. It's not, it's, it's the Crisis Response um, Center. Network. Phoenix. network. Yeah, network. Crisis it's Response Network. Prevent. Yeah, suicide it, prevention line. Another suicide prevention line, again, super high stress. And when mm. he came in as the new executive director he looked around and he, he felt this culture of fear, a very fear-based culture. And he went from person to person to person. And there's two shifts, day shifts and night shifts. He even went and met with the night shift staff one by one to get some feedback and get some input and, and figure out what was going on. And then he, he had a, them create a committee. And mm -hmm. that committee, he empowered them to make really concrete changes. And one of the things was, they had a room which was supposed to be the place for them to decompress. And uh, this is such a vivid description. The room on the walls had pictures of cacti, but of course it's Arizona. And yet here you're going to relax and you've got these prickly <laughs> images. So something as easy as changing the pictures on the wall to things that are more soothing and, and bringing the light down to something a little warmer and having more comfortable seating. And then the second thing they did uh, was that they helped to, to create an exercise room. So he heard that they really wanted that. And so he empowered them to go survey everyone, figure out what kinds of equipment people wanted. So now everyone has buy-in. They've all participated. They've got a sense of ownership over this. And then they converted an unused office space into their fitness room and people actually use it. And then that's when you had said, is it all top down? No, it's also bottom up. It's sort of all of it in between. And that's how you can make these kinds of changes. And but the, empowering employees, I think, is really big. And, and the great thing with that story is that um, the equipment was paid for by their health care insurance. You know, it wasn't an extra cost. Yeah, that's was, an important thing. I, I always like the story about, um, there's one story we share in the book, and it's such a great story. We, sh we share the end result, and it's the United Way in South Dakota. And if you visit their office every workday at 10 and 2 p.m., a bell rings. And that's everyone's signal to get up from their desks and go for a 15 or 20 minute walk. And mm. in South Dakota, you can imagine there's snow there. So they walk around the building in the winter or they walk outside <laughs> in the summertime near, to a nearby park. Um, so, I, you know, I think, wow, that's really great. But how did that get started? And um, it's interesting. They've been doing this for 15 years. And it got started when they um, brought a wellness program into the workplace. So their health insurer would, was going to give them some breaks if everyone got their biometrics, you know, their cholesterol and their blood pressure taken. And they had a wellness consult. And so out of these um, consults, um, people were saying, oh, we're not getting enough exercise. And so then at a staff meeting and discussions, they said, well, how can we do this together during the workday? Um, and they came up with this idea of doing the walks, you know. And so that's part of their employee handbook, and it's just part of the way they do their work. So if you apply for a job, you know, and they're telling you what's it like to work here, <laughs> you know, well, be, be prepared to go for a walk every day for 15 or 20 minutes. Mm. Yeah, I love that. I love hearing stories like that because I really, to me, means that they care about their employees. It's not just about, you know, whether their insurance is going down. Yeah, <laughs> which is a good thing too. Well, I mean, that's 
I mean, when we talk about measuring the results of, you know, a happy, healthy plan or, or doing these kinds of things, uh, I mean, that's the hard result. Your, your, your health insurance costs go down, productivity goes up, um, you're spending less money in um, sick days, but there's also some what we call soft benefits that translate to hard benefits. And those are if you have a culture of well-being, you have a better morale, you can attract uh, more talented uh, 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 people to work for you. There's less turnover. There's a big cost when somebody leaves after a few months because you have to bring hire someone, bring somebody in, train them. And then there's the kind of institutional knowledge gap that happens. So there's a lot of uh, really um, return on investment kinds of things that happen when you focus on well-being in the workplace. And when, when employees feel like the organization actually cares about them, they start talking about these things, these well-being activities as perks. And mm -hmm. so new employees or prospects are hearing about these perks. And they could be so oh, simple you know ones. What, yeah. uh, you know what happened is, um, okay, so we interviewed Jason um, Shim. And he works for an educational organization in Toronto, the name I'm blanking on. And so they started this thing called Crockpot Mondays. Oh my God, so psychic. I was just going to say <laughs> but, but, um, so he, uh, So they do this thing that uh, somebody got a Crockpot off of Craigslist and then somebody cooks something in the Crockpot and they sit down and they have this meal together. Now I'm on the board of N10 with um, Jason and he came up and he told me, guess what? And I said, what? Um, he said, We've, um, yesterday, the other day when somebody was hiring for a job, the person mentioned that they had heard about the Crockpot Mondays and thought it was a really cool thing to have in the workplace. So, so yeah, they do, people talk about it. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't take as much as maybe people think, you know, um, being able to, to fund putting an entire exercise room in is great, but just having the space and the allowance and, you know, letting people come up with their own ideas, that's a beautiful thing. It is. And then you can be funny about it. You can be creative about it. It's not all serious. Like one of the things uh, that Crisis Text Line does, and it came from Do Something, is they have Toto Tuesdays. So every Tuesday, they want people to leave the office on time. They really discourage working late. But on Tuesdays, they'll play Toto's Africa, the song Africa, over and over again at really loud volume <laughs> That's to great. encourage people to go out the door and to go home. And, so and, I think... Um, it's and really there's a, and there's a whole bunch of variations on that. I love that, which is that the World Wildlife Fund does Panda Fridays, and they they save the humans by by uh, <laughs> having them leave Fridays at three o'clock. You know, that's great. Well, I could talk to you guys for hours, I'm sure, but I need to wrap this up as I promised to get you out by ten forty five. Do you have any final thoughts that you want to share? Sure. I think uh, I would just want to say that self-care, we truly believe, is a sign of self-respect, that we pay it a lot of lip service, and we do ourselves a disservice, and we do everyone around us a disservice by not taking care of ourselves. Uh, we have that little picture of the uh, put on the oxygen mask first, and we hear that. But I think it bears repeating all the time, take care of yourself first or you'll be useless to everyone. And your organization suffers along with you, but the organization must support you in that. And that, those are the things we talk about in the book. And, and I, I would say that, you know, I'm assuming, you know, those of you that work in the nonprofit sector, your work is super important. And, um, and the people you serve are super important and the problems you're solve trying to solve are huge. And in order for you to serve your people <laughs> and to help um, solve some of those you know, big, hairy uh, problems that are out there, you need to think about taking care of yourself as part of doing the work and not on an individual basis, but doing it at, um, collectively as part of the way that you serve your stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Great, great. And why don't you guys tell people where they can find the book and also where they can find you? And let's start with you, Eliza. So you can find the book and information about the book, including some free downloadable worksheets and checklists and assessments at happyhealthynonprofit.org. And I'm at elizasherman.com and at Eliza Sherman on pretty much every popular social network, but I really like Twitter the most. Mm. And you yes. 
Yeah, so you can find me on Twitter at Cantor, K-A-N-T-E-R, or Beth Cantor, K-A-N-T-E-R dot org, um, where you'll find my blog and links to the other um, social networks. Cool. And just to let people know, we'll have an archive of this show on the website, mindfulsocialmarketing.com. And we will also have it on YouTube and Spreaker. So keep an eye out for that and watch Twitter because that's my favorite network too. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. It was great having you on the show. And, and best of right. luck with the book and the show. Right. The road and, shout show. Outs, and shout outs to everybody here. The great, great chat thread too. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Especially Laura, Laura and, and, and Megan, Megan and Gail, and Gail our favorite hangouters. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.